Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 87, Barbero Keiko, The Evolving Life Journey, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pippen. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we open up the curtain, see what's behind door number two, and begin this conversation, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experience says that I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck. Just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and you want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Barbero Keiko is my next guest, and my oldest son Rem was the one who connected the two of us recently, and I'm sure glad he did for a number of reasons. First, he's a really cool person, the little bit we've corresponded with each other. Second, I love speaking with people who are super passionate about something, and I always want to learn more if it can help others become a better version of themselves today than they were yesterday through health and wellness. As I tried to research for this interview, I'm not going to lie, it was a bit challenging because, unlike most people in this world, this guy is a bit of a ghost online. All I know is that he had some challenging times growing up. Somewhere along the way, health and wellness became important, which drew him to a book called Eat, Move, and Be Healthy in his early 20s that changed his life's trajectory and put him on a path that led him to where he is today and that is what I assume is a super happy place for him now. We'll find out more about his story and experiences in the coming minutes. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Barbero Keiko to the show. Barbero, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Hey there, thank you for having me. Well, uh, we, as I said in the intro, we were connected by my oldest son, Rem, and... Uh, we tried video, but it didn't work. But if you, uh, we couldn't be in two different places. I'm in an igloo <laughs> up in Minnesota, and you're on some beach in sunny California. Is that where you're making home now? Uh, usually, I'm over in Southern California. Right now, I'm actually over in Scottsdale as we're talking at this moment. Scottsdale, Arizona, with a health net. You weren't at the Super Bowl, were you? No, I'm about. I was about forty minute drive from that. Okay, awesome. Uh, okay, so we could be, you know, Rem has introduced me to uh, a lot of things, uh, not personally, like this is the first, uh, not, I've met a few people along the way, but I haven't done a podcast with anyone that uh, he's introduced us to, so thanks for being here, but as far as I know, you're not a hockey guy, but I wanted to have you on the show because it doesn't matter if you play hockey, soccer, or a musician, doctor, teacher. Uh, if you don't have your health, nothing else really matters, does it? So uh, before we get to how you're occupying your days currently, let's learn a little about you. Where would you grow up? What was your childhood like? Uh, did you play sports growing up and other interests? Uh, parents, siblings, friends? Basically, tell our listeners what it was like growing up, Barbero Keiko. So I was born, in, I'm not sure, but I was born in Sacramento, California. So that's Northern California area. And I come from a family of seven children. And I had kind of a rough time growing up for a little bit. I'll get into that in a second here. So basically what happened was my mom and dad had seven of us, and I'm the second eldest out of the seven. And I went, we went through some battles and we, a lot of us were put in foster care when I was younger. So that happened when I was around 10 years old. And I mean, I learned so much going through that process, but it, I mean, it sucked. It was sad. It wasn't easy. And I had never actually played organized sports until I was in the foster care system. So 
that was about when I was 12 years old. I just really took a liking to uh, American football. That was just something, I don't know why, I just started liking that sport. And I was playing with some of the other kids who were all bigger and stronger and older than me in the foster home that I was put into. So I got beat up a little bit, but it made me tougher as well. So I was always growing up playing with physically advanced kids and people than I was. Like some of the kids were like 17 and I was 10, you know, so that's a pretty big age gap there for being younger. And yeah, and I was doing pretty well. And I was like, okay, well, I got to enroll in football. So in that foster home, uh, it was actually a grandma that ran the foster home. She was really cool. Her, her husband had died like 10 years prior and she just basically ran a foster home for boys. And so uh, she was like, yeah, like she liked sports and she put me in football when I was 12. And at first I was just playing lineman. I don't know if people are familiar with that, but that's just a position where you block for the quarterback and the running backs. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I'm way better than this. And I played that first season at that, but the next season I came back and I was the main running back and one of the best players on the team. And I also played corner as well a lot of the time growing up. So football was my main sport. Hockey was always like one of those mystery things. Like I would go in a store, I would see like a San Jose shark shirt and I'd be like, Oh, what is this? Like <laughs> people were like, Oh, that's hot. The NHL. I was like, Oh, wow. And I just, it, you know, when I was watching sports center when I was a kid, like I would watch the NBA, the NFL, MLB, like I'd be all up to date on all the players and all the highlights. Then the NHL part would come on really quick and I would just kind of like check out and do something else. <laughs> so I was just like a mystery to me. Right. Yeah. It's so funny. Yeah. Because it just wasn't part of my culture. It wasn't part of like anybody around me was not playing hockey or even talking about hockey. And then when I was about 13 or no, I was about actually about 15. I finally went and tried ice skating. And this is after years of football and stuff. And it was just so different. Like I was on the ice, ice skating around and like, I was okay, but I was like, I was like, wow, like people are playing hockey, like on these skates and like running around and crashing into each other and all that stuff. I was just like, whoa. Like that is a freaking crazy sport. And I still didn't watch it, but I, I was like, well, like I have a lot of respect for those guys that play that sport. And I didn't know, I never knew anybody growing up that actually played hockey the whole time wow, ever. And not, not really at all until I really met Rem as far as playing hockey at any level. I mean, Troy's son plays hockey and there was a guy actually one of my Czech classes that played hockey growing up. But other than that, I really, literally knew no one. Yeah. It's you funny because so it was just it was not like the main sport. We talk about uh, I was playing in Florida with the Panthers. You don't know who the hell they are, but <laughs> anyways, Rem. Uh, no, I was, do. Okay, he he was down there, and uh, you know when he was um, up until four years old, I think. And I I tried to to get him to to try skating and and stuff like that, and he wanted no part of it because none of his friends down there uh skated or wanted anything to do with hockey so it's but right we got back up here the first kid that he met played hockey and that's how his hockey journey started so it's you know where you're born is so important yeah for sure and i remember watching like the mighty ducks and stuff when i was a kid and that part was cool you know i was like oh wow this looks pretty fun but i also didn't see that movie until i was about 13 too so right Right. but yeah they definitely made the hockey look a lot cooler than i thought it was as well back then (laughs) So you're playing football and uh, you're, you got a pretty cool foster grandma kind of guiding you. Uh, What happens then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So interestingly, interestingly enough, what happened in that particular situation was um, the foster grandma ended up getting cancer when I was four years into her home. And I, I had become one of her, like, I guess you can call quote unquote favorite kids in the home. Yeah. Like she would always have one that I I had the most longevity there. Some kids would come and go. It's a tough system, you know, and the kids are really mistreated a lot of the time. And so all that trauma and stuff just builds up. And so like she ended up getting cancer and I ended up moving in with one of my best friends at the time. She ended up passing away that year. So for eighth grade, when I was 14, I moved in with one of my best friends at the time, who was also a football player. We played together and I lived there. So it was kind of like living at a friend's house for the next like seven years. I moved out of there when I was about 20 or so. And that was fun. It was really fun. It was tough because it was like my second, it was in a way of my second abandonment, you know, because my parents, I got taken from them. And then I just like, she had really grown on me, the grandma. And then she had, you know, gotten sick and got taken up with the cancer. And then that was like my second abandonment. So now I was with my friends. Yeah, that was fun. It was, I'm not going to say it's not fun. It was fun throughout high school and all that kind of stuff. 
And I also went from living on like lower budget, I guess more people would call it poverty type stuff, like, you know, not, not having that expensive or nice stuff, all that kind of stuff with my family and the grandma to now living with a family that was more affluent and they would spend more money on stuff. So like we lived in a really nice house and a really nice neighborhood. And I, I felt like super spoiled. It was just a whole different way of life for me. And, and I will say it was kind of weird. Like it felt weird. Like I was like, wow, like I felt like I didn't deserve it. But yeah. at the same time, I, I did value it. I did value it. And, you know, I took it. And, and then I ended up getting pretty much kicked out of that family when I was about 21. We had some drama go down with me and one of the older sons of theirs, their actual son, not my friend, but his older brother. So stuff that all could have been worked through and still could be, but it just hasn't and wasn't, you know, one of those things. So I ended up getting pretty much disowned by them and we don't con have contact anymore. So that was kind of like my third, my third abandonment. Um, can, can I interrupt and then I, I have, yeah. Can I inter interrupt you just for a second before you move on? I mean, that that's, I, and I listened to something that, uh, you know, your mom and dad, there was like a 31 year age gap um, that, your dad came from another family. I mean, that's, that's a lot of uh, stuff that you have to get through. That's really heavy. Um, you know, how did, how did, what were your coping mechanisms? How did, how did you do that? And then you had different people that you, you had to stay with because you were in a system that, you know, was out of your control. I mean, how did you overcome those obstacles? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, well, when I was a kid with my parents, it was, I, I didn't really think it was that weird ex unless I went to school and kids were like, Oh, is that your grandpa? Cause my dad was older, you know, yeah. he was, I think he had me when he was like 55 or 54. And then he had my youngest brother who's 10 years younger than I am when he was 64. Wow. So like he was, pre he was getting up there in age, you know, having children still, he had two families. He had a whole family before ours. So I have like half brothers and sisters that are approaching 70 right now as we speak. Wow. And that was from a whole different life he had with a different woman before he met my mom. You know, my mom was a lot younger when he met her. And then he started another family, you know, an Italian guy just pumping out kids. Wow. And so I didn't really, yeah, so he, he was great. You know, I just didn't really get to grow up with him that much. And it was tough, like with the foster care and all that kind of stuff. But it really, I was always strong mentally. Like I was just used to having to like show up for myself. I guess you can call it that because there was a foster kids, a lot of foster kids do not take that situation very well. And I saw a lot of them go to drugs. I saw a lot of them go to like having babies really early and just kind of like doing the same dysfunctional cycle, you know, with, with having children of their own with the abuse and that type of stuff. And I was just stayed as soon as I went to my friend's house that had like the family that was, I guess you could call perfect, you know, the nice house, like the organized structured family that's all together yeah. And, you know, I just, I kind of molded into that, but I was still an outsider. Like I never looked at that as my actual family. I looked at it as my friends and like, right. I, I just, I just need to stay well behaved, which I was. And many would say more behave, better behave now than their actual children, <laughs> yeah. but it's all good. You know, it's not a competition. Uh, right. But yeah, I mean, it taught me a lot. It just taught me that, you know, I have to be like, I always had to be like self-sustainable like I didn't really know, I didn't really have something to fall back to and just rely on to like provide for me. Like I felt like I had to kind of do things on my own, even though I did technically, you know, I was having stuff bought for me. I had a home and stuff like that, but it never really felt like I had someone to completely open up to and right. to also just completely rely on. Like I felt like I was kind of alone and abandoned. So yeah, it was a lot of stuff to go through and you have any other questions on that? No, I, I mean, I, I, it's, it's all relative, you know, as far as what, what is normal, you know, my, my parents divorced when, when I was uh, just finishing fourth grade, uh, we had to move to my grandparents and, you know, I look back now hearing your story saying, you know what, it wasn't that bad, I guess, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's all relative. So, in that, you know, somehow you you had just a resolve that was stronger than most. Uh, you're playing football. Um, you're in a, a stable home. When did health and fitness become important to you? Um, and really striving for excellence. Um, 
Or was it there's something that happened that kind of brought you to where you were like rock bottom and then all of a sudden you were introduced to something and your life changed from that moment on? Yeah. So when I was a kid, I just remember seeing like, I think I was watching like Baywatch or something and the guys were like kind of like ripped, you know? Yeah. I was like, wow, like I want to look like that when I'm older and all this stuff. I think I was like eight years old then. And then when I was about 11 in the foster home, like they had some weights in the garage and I just started kind of messing around out there, lifting weights, like bench pressing, all that kind of stuff. And then when I got to eighth grade, I was like the strongest kid in the school, you know, lifting all this weight and all that stuff. And this was still like not really properly trained lifting. I was just kind of like yeah. throwing the weights around, you know, yeah. and it just progressed from there. Like once I got out of high school, I took it really seriously. So once I was 18, 19, I started to really train and go to the gym. I was doing like two a days. I was working a full-time job in a warehouse. And I was also a full-time college student taking classes. Wow. And I would still go to the gym twice a day in the morning before work. And then later at night. And I was a bit obsessive. You know, that, that was, that was kind of like a burnout thing. Yeah. And then what happened is I did that for about two years. And then when I was about 21, I found yoga. I found hot yoga and I was like, okay, I'm going to start trying this. So then, of course, I went in there and I got obsessive with that. And I started doing two, two to three classes a day. I got fired from my job and I was on unemployment at the time. So I was getting free money, you know, for the most part. Yeah. And uh, I was doing yoga. I took that as my job. I was go doing all these classes, sweating. I turned into Gumby, really flexible. And I met this teacher there who was just ahead of the game when it came to nutrition and stuff. A bunch of stuff I had never heard of because all I heard of before was all the bro science stuff. And the normal mainstream stuff that's taught in like colleges and all that yeah. in high school. And I was just like blown away. I was like, wow, like, how do you know all this stuff? And I was like 21. And he was like, oh, like, and then he had a lanyard that he would wear and it said Czech Institute on it. He's like, oh, I, I went to the Czech Institute here. Um, Paul Czech, you should look him up. And I was like, okay, great. So I wrote down the name. And as soon as I rode my bike home, I went and looked him up on YouTube. And back then he wasn't nearly as popular. But he, this guy was like an encyclopedia of advanced fitness knowledge and everything else, nutrition and stuff that I just hadn't heard before. And I was like, holy crap, like I had done all this other like studying and I'd been working out like all this way, like forever. And I had an ego too. Like I always felt like I was like ahead of the game, you know, Right, right. <laughs> and because uh, I was strong and I was in shape and like, I was like, you know, I was pretty disciplined. Like I was disciplined with eating, even though it wasn't all like healthy, but it was still disciplined. Like I didn't, I didn't drink, you know, I haven't drank alcohol since I was 18 in high school. And so I was doing all that type of stuff. And then I was still blown away by the check stuff. So I just looked him up on YouTube. I did some of the prereqs. And then the next year I was sitting in a holistic lifestyle coaching course. And this was after already doing a personal training certification through a different institution and that stuff's good for basic training, but I was like, wow, like I didn't really learn much with that. And also another thing I wanted to add too is while I was looking up the Czech Institute and Paul Czech and all this stuff, I was like in college taking classes like chemistry and all this stuff because I was going to go for a nutrition major. Sure. My whole plan was to like go to San Diego State and do nutrition and all this stuff. And I was kind of like just messing around in college before that, just not knowing what I want to do, but taking prereqs and I was at a junior college and then I was focusing on the Czech stuff the whole time and reading his book, how to eat, move and be healthy. And like reading about metabolic typing and all these other books outside of college, like that were not part of the curriculum, you know? So right. basically I just had to quit college. I basically quit after that summer doing that chemistry lab. And wow. I went full go into the Czech Institute stuff. So you're gaining all this knowledge, yeah. but like the, the hot yoga, um, and then now with Paul, you're just, you're just in working out. I mean, you were just working out and using stuff, but you weren't trying to acquire this knowledge or to get your body to a certain point to be able to start coaching people. It sounds like you were just doing it for yourself and trying to figure out how to maintain the day that you created. Yeah. At first it was all for myself. Even the certification for the personal training was really for myself. And I did have a plan in the future. Like, you know, once I kind of master more of this stuff, I, I did want to teach it and have that be my job that I'm paid for and all that. And I did that for a couple of years. I practiced all the check exercises myself. I got them all down. Like I really 
practiced hard. I worked out at home and then I started going to the gym and doing all the lifts. And it was just so much different than I would lift before because it wasn't as functional before. And there were certain key things in form and technique and posture that I wasn't even aware of before or thinking about. And I started implementing all that stuff. And then as I kept going through the Institute classes, which were really addicting to me, <laughs> because I was learning all this new stuff. And, right. and then I started sharing information with friends and family. Like it became addicting to learn, you know, and, right. and start utilizing it. I didn't utilize every single thing myself, but I did do quite a bit of the stuff. And that also took me down another path of just studying outside of the Institute, you know, with my own studies, like a lot of the reading and then always listening to books and lectures and podcasts and stuff of value and taking, you know, what works for me as a cliff note version and using that and, you know, I just had, a, I've developed a great skill of listening to where I can just discard a lot of the nonsense. Cause there's so much filler in a lot of books and a lot of material. And I'm, I'm really good at like navigating through that type of stuff. Now, you know, after so much practice of being a student. Do you, so for me, my, my primary focus, my area of expertise, I guess, is helping players get really good with a stick and puck passing, stick handling, shooting. Um, and it took me probably 12 to 13 years before I, I finally said, okay, I think I'm in the master category. I got this dialed in. And just like you said, uh, you only can have a chance to get close to that by practicing. So are, did you start getting to that point where you're like, okay, I, I feel like I got this thing pretty dialed in now. What's the next step? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was thinking that way. I was like, wow, like, you know, I don't feel confident really getting paid to teach this stuff unless I'm kind of like a master at it. I was also kind of um, checked on that one too by Paul Check later on. <laughs> Cause he's like, you don't, you know, there is no perfectionist. You just start implementing stuff and you learn as you go. And I was like, okay, well that's, tr that sounds right. You know, which is true. And that's what I teach now as well, like in business and in any health stuff. But I was like that where I took a lot of time and I was like, okay, once I get all this stuff down perfectly, I'm going to start training and like all this stuff. But then I, you know, I started taking the courses. I, once I started taking the Chuck courses, I started to actually train with the guy that was teaching yoga, one of my friends, Ryan, at the time. And he actually opened up his studio. He had a private training studio and allowed me to start working with some of his clients. And then I started getting some of my own. So I was working out of a private studio for a bit there. And it was actually really good. And I gained so much knowledge out of that because I actually right. got to like start implementing the skills, you know? Right. And especially at the young age, I was like 22 when I started that 23 and I did that for a couple years, a couple days a week. And then I taught some boot camp classes. So like he was just getting me exposed to more and more, which is awesome. He's about eight years older than I am. So he was pretty established already in the space. And yeah, it was just so good. But to, to actually start doing it with others felt so good. Like that, like doing it myself felt amazing in the beginning too, but actually starting to do it with others felt great. Well, until you start doing that as well, you don't know what's on the other side of that door. Um, they say you can't, you can't be a, a master at anything until you start teaching it. And that's the same thing. You know, I, I had to relinquish my life as a player and surrender <laughs> to becoming a coach and uh, start at the beginning and it, it it takes some time but man uh the next person that kind of you meet uh through the czech institute and the classes you're going uh through uh, is a guy named troy casey uh and he gets you involved in uh kind of the the next level of what's going on in your life yeah so when i in december of 2011 it was my second holistic lifestyle coaching course and that was actually with paul check in person so I was like super excited about that. I was 24 years old. It was in San Diego and <laughs> it was, there was like 50 people and there was a big group, yeah. including many people today that are pretty high up in the Institute and just working at a high level, including one of his wives and as a student at the time. So anyway, so I, I, I connected with Troy pretty well. Like he was just an interesting character and he had his daughter who was like a year old at the time, like balancing on one foot on his hand, like a ballerina. And I was just like, Holy crap. Oh, yeah. Like, this looks so cool. And then he was talking, yeah. And then he was talking about like a bunch of herbs and just, he had like these big eyes, like full of life. And just, he was like so passionate about talking about all this stuff. And he was cool. So we sat by each other and like, you know, we kind of made friends and stayed connected. And then the next year 
2012, we had the, the next to the last level of the holistic lifestyle coaching program, HLC three with check again, it was a smaller group, but it was more advanced as well. And that was a six day thing. So during that class, uh, Paul went around and asked everybody, what is the number one thing right now that if we're removed would help take your life to the next level, you know, in a nutshell. And then he'd give us like 30 minutes each or so, of basically some therapy. <laughs> and mine was, my whole thing was like, yeah, like I, you know, I really need to break out of my shell. I'm pretty selfish. Like I haven't explored much, a bunch of stuff like that. And then Troy being the loud guy that he's like, oh, I'll take you to the Amazon with me. And I was like, oh, okay. I like, I had no idea what that meant. I just thought we were going on a trip to like the rainforest, you know? Yeah. And Tr Paul checks like, yeah, you should do it. You should do it. Like, that would be awesome for you. And then Paul goes to the next level and he's like, okay, come up, come on up here in front of the class really quick. I was like, all right, great. And he's like, all right, everyone else stand up and go to the back of the room. And I was like, uh, are you going to make me like commit to this in front of everybody? He's like, absolutely. He's like, all right. So one by one, everyone come up. So I had to say to everybody like, yeah, I'm going, I'm going to change my life with Troy Casey in the rainforest. And I would just like, you know, I would like to have your support. Do I have your support on this mission? I had to ask that to all like 35 people. Cause another thing too, was I said that I never really felt supported. And that went back to the foster care thing and everything from my childhood. Sure. I never really felt like I was fully supported to like take on and go to the next level. So that was one of Paul's things. He's like, yeah, you're going to get everybody support right now. And being me, like I just committed it to in front of everybody. So I couldn't chicken out of the trip, you know? So I had to order the tickets right then. I ordered our plane tickets and, you know, no took care of all that. So like, yeah. So less than a month later, we're on a plane going to Peru. And actually the day before we left, I was talking to Troy and he's like, yeah, like, you know, when, when you're there with a the medicine, just, you know, kind of check in and, you know, you can have as much as you want. And I was like, wait, 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 wait what, what, what medicine are you talking about? And he's like, oh, what do you mean? I was like, what medicine are you talking about? Like, I thought we were just going on a trip. He's like, oh, yeah, the, the ayahuasca. So I was going there for ayahuasca ceremonies as well. So that right. part I kind of missed in the whole thing. You know, and, I, and I'm somebody that doesn't smoke. I don't drink. I haven't done any drugs. I've never even experimented with any drugs. And I was, like, kind of scared, you know, because here I, now I'm going to do a ceremony with the hallucinogenics and all this stuff. And – we got out there and like, I was kind of homesick. You know, I was the kind of guy that I, I was kind of like I used to be. I was really stuck in my ways of lifting and doing all this movements and studying all the Czech stuff. And so like getting out to the rainforest for 10 days and being in these bungalows, which were really well built. And it was great. Like the scenery was awesome. Everything was awesome. The ceremonies were cool, but I was like, I found myself challenged out there too. Like, well, I can't wait to go home. Like I, I want to go eat butter again and all the meats and everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause they had us on like a, pretty structured strict meal plan because the medicine integrates better that way so and that was my first like really trip and exposure to troy outside of the classes and like texting and being online you know right so we became closer with that and then back then he also offered me his business opportunity at the time he was working with an amazon herb company and i think he was doing pretty well and i was just like terrified of that i was like oh no i'm just training right now like you know, I basically told him no for business for nine years until 2020. Wow. You know, we've been friends the whole time and we've been friends the whole time. Like, you know, and there was always the question, like, are you going to join me in business and all this stuff? And I would always be like, no, you know, now's not a good time. And just couldn't wait to like change the topic, <laughs> you right. know? Um, so, so what you, you, you started the check Institute, you know, 2010 ish. And then you say you're, you didn't, kind of take Troy uh, up on his business opportunity until 2020 ish. What were you doing in between there for work? I mean, were you just uh, <laughs> training and playing the guitar on the street corner? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's exactly what I was doing. I was doing, I was doing some training with people. I was also okay. doing some side hustling, like buying and selling stuff and selling it. And that's about it. I was doing a ton of studying and, Wow. kind of laying out in the sun, like doing leisure life, definitely hiding. I, I would say in a way, hiding from really getting, you know, my skill set out there and helped, and hiding from touching as many people as I could and just kind of storing and collecting information and just kind of earning as the least amount of money I could just to get by and kind of build a savings. But I was not like fully out there, you know? So in a way I was kind of like doing checks training and all that stuff, a disservice by not sharing it as much as I could and implementing it into other things. And then in about 2017, when I turned 30, I 
got kind of depressed about all this. So I, I just kind of checked out of everything. I stopped training. I, well, I kept working out and I kept studying. I kept doing all that, but I just checked out of training. I checked out of like even trying to find a job. I started living off my savings and my credit cards and that lasted for about three years. And then that, whole, and then that whole Corona stuff happened. And I, I'm the kind of guy that like, I'm not a negative person, but I look at everything, not everything, but most things that go on in the world and kind of dig into it a little bit. You know, I learned that from Chuck, my days with Chuck and all that. So like I already had somewhat of a negative type of, you know, outlook on a lot of society and stuff like that. And like, like the money system. And I started looking at all this stuff and beyond and got in a way depressed, like, wow, like, you know, I feel like I'm screwed. Like, what's the point of me even going back in society? And then the Corona stuff happened. And then I was like, oh my God, here we go. Like, you know, I got depressed for a while and to see like how people were reacting to it. I was like, oh my gosh, like, you know, I, this is worse than I thought it was <laughs> with people. And I was just like judging everything. And then finally in October of 2020, I went and kind of reconnected with Troy and he was over in Sedona, Arizona. And I was still in Sacramento. So like I came South, I had some friends in Corona. I stayed with them for a little bit. And then I went out to Sedona to hang out with Troy. And I was there for six weeks at his house. And I had zero plans of joining him. I didn't know what my next business move was. And he's just, you know, he gave me the offer again. You know, I did some of his man clan man, men events and I, I said, yeah, I'll try it. Like I used some of the unemployment money that I had at the time and bought, you know, the, the kit to buy, the, buy some of the superfoods to join the business. And I just started doing it. And at first I kind of wanted to chicken out. I was thinking of ways I was going to like leave the business. I was also trading crypto at the time, doing some cryptocurrency, uh, like day trading, mm -hmm. which was super distracting by the way. And I had to cut that out a couple months later entirely just to focus on actually helping people again because crypto trading is not helping anybody. Right. It's not, you know what I mean? It's, that's not help. That's not a service because in order for you to earn money in crypto, you have to, people have to lose their money and they get nothing in return for that loss. Whereas if you're providing a service or training or providing them with healthy product, like sure, they're giving up some money, but they're actually getting something in return. Right. <laughs> right? right. So like, I just, I just put all that together and I was like, okay, well, I can't do the crypto anymore. And plus it's the whole, there's the whole other aspect of all the digital control and everything as well, that, which is what that's leading to. So I was like, okay, well, I value holistic health and working with others a lot more than I value some digital number on a screen. So I checked out of that and I started putting all my focus into the, the superfoods business. And that's, you know, been growing ever since and I've been doing great. And I've been using, you know, indirectly a lot of the check stuff that I learned as well, just about like you know, different mindset stuff and different stuff for myself. And like having the health education definitely helps, you know, leading people through programs and stuff like that. And I, and I know it so well, it's, it's just quick because I studied it for so long. But the cool thing about it is like, and I teach people this, like you don't have to know all that stuff to be, to be like helpful to others. You just get started and you start, and you just start doing it. So that's what I've learned during that time. Well, for the, the one question that I have for you is, um, you know, for for so long, you know, I, I mean, it sounds like you were the minimalist before being a minimalist became cool. <laughs> uh, what what did you learn from just that patience? And are you are you at the a good spot where you're you're not, you know having to figure out stuff, you know, where you kind of get are in a, a good spot and you'll kind of spiral out from there, but you're not like searching for that, that one thing that's going to kind of bring clarity or make you whole. Yeah. One thing I learned about taking my time with it was I learned that, you know, the grass isn't always greener. So I'm not always out there continually searching for something better and bigger. Yeah. And I also learned, yeah, and I've always been that way too. Like that's always kind of been my thing. Like when I start focusing on something, I stick with it for a bit instead of just bouncing and dabbling into all these other things. Because yeah. I've noticed that that's a tremendous problem right now on the internet and with a lot of people in general, kids, you know, even adults, like there's so much dabbling going on. So like the grass is always greener Then also being three feet from gold. You know, that's, that's a Napoleon Hill thing. Like when you're getting close to a breakthrough, that's not the time to abandon it. That's the time to stick with it. Even if it's at the toughest point, 
which it usually is. Like the toughest point is usually there before the big breakthrough. And that's when a lot of people abandon the ship when they're right about to break through to the next level. So like that helps me keep going as well. You know, those two things, but the patience of waiting that long and I, I wouldn't say I was lost cause I always had a certain outlook on everything. And I had plans on, you know, getting out there again, but that patience really helped me cause it, I wasn't out there dabbling into a bunch of different stuff and like following my friends and doing all this different stuff. I was like focused still on a path with all the studies and stuff that I was doing. So like the focus was huge, just like in athletics. Like if you're a hockey player and you're dabbling in baseball and tennis and golf and football, like you're probably not going to be a high level hockey player. Right. Right. Oh yeah. What, uh, so how much of your day back then was habitual, you know, I mean, to get, when you're in a learning phase, I mean, your day is pretty structured. I mean, you just can't sit there and read for eight hours and listen to stuff. But um, how, how structured of a day did you have? And do you continue to still have it at that uh, level? Yeah. So when I was studying, well, actually, I, I had headphones in my ear pretty much the whole day with really? different books playing and different. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. Like, that's what I was doing while I was not working and all that kind of stuff. Like, I was started, I was collecting information, right? I was hoarding, about, but I was hoarding a lot of it. I wasn't out there using it in, as a service and providing that to people. So I had a big buildup, but that was a lot of my day was just working out and studying stuff and laying out in the sun. And I had a good friend that always would make fun of me. He's like, Oh, how, how long are you going to do that for? <laughs> you know, I was staying at my sister's house, paying cheap rent. I was paying cheap rent and I was not working for a bit, but when I was earning money, I was saving quite a bit of money as well. And I was only investing a lot of that money into more education and more products and stuff like that. So trying out different stuff and trying out different like supplements and all this kind of stuff. So all of my money went into like courses and books and like audios and all that type of stuff, that lifestyle. And my day was like that. I would wake up, I'd go to the gym, I'd come back, I'd, I'd be listening to stuff or reading books and laying out in the sun and going for walks and doing all that. And I wasn't really on social media at all. I was barely on social media. I had Facebook and I deleted it in 2015. And then I didn't even have social media again until 2021 when I made this Instagram account just to keep up with some business people and not be a complete 100% ghost on the internet. So I made that Instagram account. And now it's, now it's similar, really. The only difference between now and then is like I'm actually serving people now. Like I'm helping people with their health. I'm helping people with business. And I'm helping myself because as I'm doing that, like I'm learning more. You know, and I'm, and I'm, I'm establishing more of the discipline and I keep going. Like there's times I want to quit, but I just keep sticking with it. And right. so the, the difference is that I'm helping others now more so. Like I'm still doing a lot of the, like the studying, even though it's kind of redundant at this point. But I'm still doing that. I'm still taking care of my body. And yeah, I'm just keep, I keep going. Yeah, I'm a to. student. I'm like, I, I, do, I do Qigong every day. You know, the Qigong meditation. Yeah. Um, you want to explain that really quick? I don't know if a lot of people know I think what that, that is. That would be great because, uh, you know, I've, I've done some solo, I've done a solo episode on uh, meditation because I didn't formally do it. But, you know, now that I have spent some time learning about uh, the different forms of it, you know, prayer is a, is a form of it. And, um, uh, but yeah, tell us a little bit about that. And uh, uh, I think our listeners, because, I mean, that's the one thing. I mean, hockey, that's that's one thing that my listeners, they they chose to, to make important in their life. But there's a lot more to the day and a lot more to uh, that goes into feeding the physical part of playing a sport. Uh, there's the mental and the, you know, the 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 nutritional part of it. And this is one thing. So, yes, please explain it a little bit to our listeners. Yeah, cool. So first, I was never about any type of meditation. When I first signed up for yoga when I was 21, like my whole thing was to, to be the best yoga phys- yoga person physically. Like, oh, I'm holding the best poses. I'm doing the most classes. But it was totally, that was like a workout mentality into the yoga. So like I didn't do like the, the more Zen classes of sitting there and meditating and like all that type of stuff. It was like fire. They were like workout classes pretty much. So like when I 
I didn't really get into meditating until the next year. Like I would try some silence stuff. I was like, all right, this is kind of stupid. And then I, when I started going to the Czech Institute, Paul Czech's really big on Qigong, the Taoist, the Taoist uh, meditation and martial arts, like Tai Chi is the martial art version. And so he was big on that. And I started practicing some of those moves because I was like, okay, this guy knows everything about everything. So I'll try what he's saying. And I started trying some of those moves. We learned it in the class with them. And I did what's called a 100-day gong in 2011. So a 100-day gong is 100 consecutive days of doing qi gong. And qi gong, qi is like the Taoist form of the Indian like uh, prana, which is like the life force, energy, vitality that runs everything. So qi is that, the Taoist philosophy. And gong is a practice. So it's like an energy, vitality, cultivation practice. And the gong is 100 consecutive days of it. And if you miss one day, you got to start over from day one. So I was like, okay, well, I can't miss one day. So I had this whole, whole checklist and I would literally check off every single day. And I was doing it for like 20 minutes, right? And it was great. Like I was learning, I, I started like getting into deeper levels of meditation. Like my body felt better. Like I felt yeah. more fluid and like I was retaining more stuff that I was studying. So I did that in 2011. And then over the years between that and 2016, I would just kind of, I would do a gong here and there, but I didn't do it every day. And then in 2016, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to do Qigong every freaking day. So since then, I've been doing it every single day. And I haven't missed a day since then. And I always switch up every 100 days different moves that I want to work on for my Qigong practice. So there's a bunch of different types of moves. Um, just like even if it's just moving my hands slowly, pulling them apart, and then slowly bringing them together to where they're almost touching, you can really feel the key build up. So you yeah. feel like that energetic force build up. So I do that every single day, no matter what. And I've had to, I've laid down at night before and I was like, holy shit, I didn't do my Qigong today. So I got up, I set my timer and I started doing it when I was like dead tired. So I've had, I've worked it in between so much. I've had really busy days. I've had to work it in. Like I have to like escape something or I'll go around and just hide somewhere to, just to get that Qigong done, Right. <laughs> you know, cause so, I'm like disciplined with it. Yeah. So doing it that that's part of your day. It's like breathing, eating. Uh, are you still doing full workouts or full yoga in addition to that on other days as well? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't do yoga as much anymore, but like working out in the gym, I still lift pretty regularly okay. four days a week or so. And I'll do Qigong no matter what, if I lift or not. And I usually walk for about 40 minutes to an hour a day too. Like in the evening time, I like to catch the sunset. Sure. It depends on where I am, but if I'm at home in Southern California, I'm usually always out there walking the dog and watching the sunset. Yeah. And I, by the way, with the key gong, the Zen swing, if you look up Paul check Zen swing on YouTube or even Troy, he has a lot of videos on the Zen swing. Like that's a really good one for hockey players to do and start practicing the key gong. Cause it really helps build a fluid spine. Yeah. And it's just like rock. You're kind of like rocking back and forth. So I've noticed my body control got a lot better when I started doing all the key gong and Tai Chi movements. And then also putting that in the, like with, uh, with in the practice of like lifting weights. So like I'll go on the gym, I'll do a little key gong and then I'll start lifting like deadlifts and different stuff. And it just helps, it helps me like keep focus on like form and all that kind of stuff when I'm lifting. Cause I, I watch people in the gym and most people are just, they, you might as well put a blindfold on them, how they're lifting. Like they're completely out of alignment. And they're just like throwing weight around and throwing their body around. Right. And like, I still see that now. I'm like, wow, like I'm 12 years, 13 years into this stuff. Like I can, I can imagine still doing this. Like these people get so much pain. And then the nutrition part's key. Like I'm really big on gut health and eating really good, clean food, which helps big time because that helps clean the intestinal tract and that helps your core function. And if you have strong core function, like as you know, with hockey, that's going to improve your ability on the ice to balance. And you're going to be much more integral with everything. Like it, it improves your nervous system and improves the firing of your core muscles and which goes into the extremities and all that. So like, you know, just even something as simple as really cleaning out the gut and eating a good solid, like nutritious diet and avoiding a lot of the trigger foods and a lot of the bad stuff, like you're going to see a, a dramatic improvement in performance. And that's, that's what Rem's been doing too. And he's told me, how much of an improvement he's seen, you know, over the last couple of years since he's known about Paul check and everything. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, there's there's this so much. Um, you know, I got I got a couple more questions if you're if you still have the time. Uh, and thank you. This has this been uh, so informative. Um, you, this great messaging, and uh, I'm just really enjoying it. So I get in front of a lot of really driven uh, people that uh, have lofty goals. They have big dreams. Uh, and what if, you know, they're the one thing that they haven't spent much time learning about is, you know, nutrition, health and wellness. Um, how, how, how can you help the people that I get in front of, or how can some of the people that I get in front of get in, you know, in front of you to, uh, get a little bit of your wisdom and, uh, guidance to help them through this journey? I am a ghost on the internet for the most part, and that's going to change eventually. But I am available on my Instagram account as Captain Informer, and I use that as kind of like a texting service for the most part. I don't really post that much. I do do some stories. But also, I can also set you up with my information for my number and my email. I'm usually good directly be in contact with like that. But if you want to see the type of philosophy that I work with, look up guys like Paul Check on the internet and look up guys like Troy Casey. Like those are people that I've worked with and studied under and, you know, we're all kind of similar. And then I have different options. So like I don't coach as much directly anymore, but I do put people through organic superfood programs. And I also do a lot of work with entrepreneurship as well and getting people started with that as I keep building my entrepreneurship skills. So oh, uh, there's a couple of different ways. Of working. Yeah. You speak of uh, college, how, uh, how important it is for, for kids to go to college these days. To me, not as important as when I was a kid, that's for sure. Well, yeah, same thing. And, you know, like I said earlier, like I quit the college to go do something I really wanted to do, which was the Czech Institute. And, and I learned way more than I would have ever learned by going to college courses for kinesiology and nutrition by doing that. So I, I feel, I mean, unless you're going to work for the system forever as like a lawyer or a doctor or a nurse and that kind of stuff, I don't think you really need it at all. Like everyone I know that's went to college and has these degrees, like I'll just be real. They're not very intelligent outside of their little paper stuff that they learned in their college education. Like I've seen a lot of people that I'm, I was just blown away with how little they know about most stuff outside of that curriculum they were taught. So yeah. I look at college as more of like an indoctrination type thing and like a money grab than anything, unless you're working as a certain profession that really needs that degree and that training. Like if you're a lawyer, like you kind of got to know the law school stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like if you're a medical doctor or a surgeon, like, okay, like you need that training, but most other stuff, you don't need to go to college. If you're going to college for business, you're completely wasting your time. That's number one, because you can learn yeah. business much quicker and cheaper doing it yourself and start learning more stuff. I mean, even on the internet has a ton of free info on all that. Oh yeah. So yeah. Yeah, to answer the question really quick, I don't feel it's that important. Other than like if somebody wants to go and get a party experience and meet a bunch of different people. And if it's their first time like living away from their parents, like all that kind of stuff. But as far as actual education goes and like it it leading to like business and success, I, I, I think it's almost useless unless you're one of those professions I named off earlier. Yeah. Totally agree with or you. If you're, or if you're playing or if you're or if your goal is to like play sports, maybe it's good to go to college. If you plan on going pro, like they do get looked at a lot more, of course, if they're playing at a big school. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, hockey's, uh, you know, every sport's a little different as far as the, the path to the, to the pro level. But, um, you know, college definitely gives, you know, is, is, a, is a path, a requirement. So if, you, if you're going to take that college route of, of a path to get four years of uh, growth, education, and uh, expert training, um, that's what you have to do. But uh, I got a degree and, you know, I, I guess I've used a little bit of it, but uh, I, I don't think that it's, it's needed. And I, I would support everything that you just said on that. So um, the last question I have for you, my friend, before I let you go is uh, what's the most proud uh, are you of overcoming or accomplishing or achieving? What are you most proud of? I would say it's not caving into 
the a lot of the vices of society. So a lot of the addiction stuff, like I, I'm just so such a stickler against caving into what everyone else is doing. And I've been like that a lot of my life, like even through the growing up in foster care and all that. So not caving into the the traps, like all the drugs and chasing down different jobs and chasing down all the girls and like going out there and like changing who I am to try to attain other stuff because it's, you know, it's like seen as like cool or success to society and avoiding all that is probably my biggest successes so far in my life to be real. I mean, I mean, I, I can't think of anything better than that than just being myself and, and liking being myself, liking being different, liking not. And that's like kind of how I view success as well is like wanting, enjoying what I currently have without comparing it to the other people's results out there. So like, yeah, I'm not a multimillionaire in business. That's great. But I've been around people that are millionaires and I wouldn't trade my physical health for theirs. You know, I wouldn't trade anything for theirs from what I see right. because I, I value myself that much. And yeah. will I eventually be a millionaire? I don't know, you know, hopefully, but it's not the end all be all success is, you know, really wanting what I currently have and being of service to me. Definitely. The, the monetary thing is a, is a byproduct of, you know, a, a good process and lifestyle and, and the way I see it too is like I, I don't have a problem spending all the money I want on quality food, quality education, going wherever I want, you know, living life on my terms, not checking into a job. Like that stuff's great. I know there's a lot of millionaires that can't really say all that. They usually have a lot of money put in different areas or they're trapped to a certain like corporation or who knows, maybe they, they have some like blackmail on them or whatever. Or they're like in an unhappy family situation. So you know, it goes both ways. So that's why the success thing isn't always about money to me. No, but it does, definitely helps to have enough to do what you want. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, totally agree. Totally agree. Well, uh, my friend, I'll, I'll never forget you. And not because it was a, a great in, interview. It's just because I've never met a person named Barbero before. So <laughs> thank you for sharing your life journey and making an imprint uh, on me. Uh, what a positive uh, story that you have. I mean, you, you had a, a, a tough, tougher start than most, but found out a way to, to persevere and, and thrive in some of the most difficult circumstances and uh, have carved your own path and have not, uh, you know, kind of succumbed to, to what normal normalcy would be for, for the rest of the world. You, 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 walk to the beat of your own drum, I guess. So uh, congratulations on just having a great story and finding your way and um, persevering um, and sharing it with us. Uh, I'm gonna, when I edit this, I'll go through everything and add uh, Paul Check and Troy Casey, their, their information in there and uh, the other things just where people can learn a little bit more about uh, some of the people and the information that uh, really influenced you to where you are today. Yeah, that's great. And then also, you know, I'm leaving it open for the future. If you ever want me to come back on and be talk more specifically into nutrition and other stuff that can help improve performance, I'd be glad to do that at some point in the future. So that offer is always there. Well, I'd love to. Um, is there, can you give us a two minute, you know, quick thing on that, that, you know, how important it is, uh, nutrition for performance for, for elite athletes or any athlete? Yeah. So, I mean, the basic way to look at it is your body is constructed of what you're consuming. And if you're consuming junk, your body, you might still be able to perform at a high level for a while but it eventually, it eventually catches up with you. And a clean and way of eating and living adds higher levels of awareness and vitality. Vitality is the life force, and awareness is being aware. And you can't really have one without the other. And as you know, like awareness is key, not just in sports, but in life in general. So like the stronger and cleaner you can be with your eating and all that, and you're just gonna perform at higher levels. It's gonna improve your nervous system. It's going to improve your reaction time. It's going to improve everything, your balance, your strength, your speed, your agility, all that stuff. 
because quality in equals quality out. So that's a quick synopsis of it all. And we could get into more details later on. Yeah, no, that that's, uh, I love that quote, quality in quality out. Uh, it's, it's where, you know, I guess whatever endeavor you're doing, you know, are you going to reach exceptional status and exceptional status? Uh, what I understand it is you will do everything to, to get to where you want to go. Uh, and there's no wavering. You will, uh, you will exhaust every option to, to get, you know, the best optimization out of yourself in every aspect and every sector of your life. So, uh, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely would agree. Awesome. Well, that's why I always live that way. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, it's taken you a while probably to, to find, you know, get to where your day is right now to, and it's forever being tweaked, but, uh, it's taken me a while to, to find my day and to, to really make sure that I have all the things in my 24 hours that are most important to me. So, uh, I know, uh, where I am today has been influenced by you and the people that have influenced you. So, Rivero, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for being not only a, a positive influence and a, a guiding force for for my son uh, and us, but all the other people that you get in front of on a daily basis. So thank you very much for being here and sharing your story. I can't thank you enough. Hey, you're welcome. You know, it's an honor to be able to do all this stuff. And like I said before, it always helps me improve myself when I'm helping others. So it's like I'm constantly a student at the same time, which I love. So yeah, thanks for having me on here. I appreciate it. It was a great conversation. So yeah. hope everyone got a lot of value out of it. Yep. Perfect. And I think I'll take you up on it. We'll have to do this again, my friend. Sweet. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing about Barbero Keiko's evolving life journey. Some people have a tougher path to travel, but pretty cool to hear how Mr. Keiko looked the monster in the face, stood his ground, and now is reaping the benefits of a life lived the right way with helping others as the gas that fuels his days. I'll put the links to what he mentioned during the interview in the description. If you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.